I, I think part of the hesitation with storytelling and a plan is for some reason the plan feels rigid to me and this is supposed mm. to be this mm -hmm. loose like airy feeling like it just kind of evolves into a story no you've got to have a plan of attack i mean at our firm it's understand understand where we want to go what we want to do who our audience is all the understanding mm -hmm. plan and then execute mm -hmm. Welcome to the Storycraft Podcast for Storytellers. I'm your host, Meg Adams, and I'm here to help you explore how stories shape our connections. Wondering how stories help you network in advance? Looking to bridge online and face-to-face -face worlds, foster understanding and ignite innovation? Look no further. Whether you're a leader, communicator, educator, or just love a good story, join us for actionable insights and real talk with professional storytellers, all aimed at helping you build stronger, better connections. Today I'm joined with Sue Grabowski of Desidara. Did I get that one right? Yes. You did. Desidara, yay, marketing firm. And I am just so excited to have you on the podcast today, Sue, because you have 27 years of experience in marketing, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah it must have started when I was like five years old or yeah. something like that. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But you were also a former journalist as well. So um, a lot, it's funny, a lot of the people that have been on the podcast with us or that we, I've met in the field of PR or marketing and advertising have a, some foundation in journalism, which I think is, is interesting because the two are, are very aligned. Uh, so I did kind of want to start there. Could you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you started your career um, and give us a short, I know we could probably talk about this all day, but uh, to where you are currently. Yeah, sure. And thanks for having me, Meg. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I uh, I have to go way back. Um, I'm the the first of my family to um, go to college. My my older sister went to college for some classes, but I'm the first to graduate from college, and and really just thought I would get out of high school and get a job. And um, I'm a two six graduate. <laughs> I hated high school didn't do very well. Uh, mostly it just, just didn't care. Um, but I really, really liked my visit to Malone university. Mm. And so, uh, and I had a cousin that went there and I, so I asked my parents if I could go and, and they agreed. I mean, obviously I have to work to put myself through and, and they helped me out too. But, uh, I went in as a music major because the oh. only thing that I knew was I took 12 years of piano and, uh, I thought, well, that's really all the only skill set that I have. Um, mm -hmm. I did, I did work at my dad's business from age 12 on. I mean, when you have your, my dad was a mechanic and so oh, he, wow. learned, he learned how to work hard early, yeah. but I didn't really know. So first year intro to communications required gen ed class, uh, at the end of that semester, my professor, who is Dr. Kim Phipps, who's now president at Messiah college in Pennsylvania, she pulled me aside and she said the following words to me. She said, would you take a journalism course? I see some promise in your writing. Hmm. That's the sentence she said, and it radically changed my life. I never went back to music. I fell in love with journalism and came editor of the school paper. And, uh, but I did really want, you know, PR at that time was not a major. Oh, so long ago. This is, you know, three decades ago. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a major yet. So I, at least, and, and Malone being a liberal arts school, I was a communication arts major but I had to specialize in journalism or broadcasting or teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I managed to, I stayed in journalism, but I took a lot of business courses. I knew I didn't want to be straight journalism. Uh -huh. um, so I, I, and I, I did a PR internship at a hospital, but, um, but I also worked as a stringer when I got out of school, I worked as a stringer for a newspaper at night. And that means wow going to all the council meetings and yeah. board meetings and covering the local beat and then going back to the paper and writing up the story. Uh, and then I worked at a trade magazine, which some people don't know what that is, but every industry has their own set of associations as well as magazines that are specialty toward that industry. And so I worked at an automotive trade magazine, ironic because my dad owned a yeah. garage. I think he knew a lot about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, after that, I went to a very small ad agency. It was the owner, the office manager and me, and she was a vicious editor, Marie oh. Covington, who I <laughs> love to this day. And 
again, that made me a good writer because the, the stronger the editor that you have, the better the writer you become, I believe. And so she would, you know, just, this is before computers. I mean, this is mm. redlining my typewritten stuff. And I remember taking it to her and she redlined it and I fix it, take it back to her. And she redlines it again and fix it. I took it back to her again and she's still redlining it. And I said, Marie, like how many versions are we going to do? And she said, every single time you'd hand it to me, I could find a way to make it better. I can live with like number three, but, but we're we, I could go to 10. And she used to edit the editorials in the Beacon Journal and send them back to the editor. And so she, I love that. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so I really, um, you know, so my career really took off there because I saw her agency and said, I want to do this. Mm. I think I could do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went and got big company experience at Progressive Insurance so that I knew what it was like to work inside a large firm, which was hugely beneficial. And when I left in 1997, Progressive came with me as my first client and wow. off we went. So that's really a long, long story, but, um, writing was really the foundation of my firm. Uh, we have, you know, and, and over time added design and obviously digital things now because we're all digital, but I believe that message is still the most important thing and how that gets translated into cool video or graphics or, you know, campaigns, that's awesome. But if you don't have the right rest message that resonates with the audience, it, it, you're not going to get the results that you want. Thank you for sharing all of that. I feel like we could unpack so much of what you said there, but I want to start with uh, the idea. It seems like the theme or a theme, one of the themes I heard in your career story was that you had some really wonderful mentors, uh, some people who um, saw potential in you, but also cared enough to be, it sounds like hard on you and, and make yes. you better. And so I think that I, well, as I, I sit on both sides of that. So as a professor, you know, I, I, I'm always, always like, you're so nice, but I'm like, yeah, but I got to give you the criticism too. Right. So I'm wondering well, do you have any suggestions for young people who are maybe at the start of their career and at the end or in the middle or wherever about how to find a mentor or how to, how to seek out those people that are going to like true mentors that are going to refine and make you better? Yeah. Um, I struggle with it a little bit because, you know, we as humans like to hear what we like to hear. That's true. Um, part of the, you know, I would not have looked back at say Marie Covington, who was my boss, I wouldn't have called her my mentor at that time. Mm -hmm. What she was, was a very, um, sh she had high standards and she held me to them. And I don't know that I could appreciate at the time what she was doing, but I yeah. certainly can now. Yeah. You know, she, um, she used to make us, we used to go to the Akron round table, uh, every month for lunch and about an hour before, and again, this is the day with no computers, we would sit in the conference room and read the first section of the newspaper front to back so that we would be ready to speak on any topic that came up at the table. Mm. At that age, I'm like, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? Why is she making us do that? Why are you making me do this? And now I go, that was just stinking brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think sometimes we want to find a mentor or someone who's going to be kind of that nurturing coach mm. to us. When I believe that if you're going to pick somebody, pick somebody who has exacting high demand standards I love for, that them, advice. for themselves. Right. Cause you'll see it. Yeah. And then ask them to hold you to their standards. Um, I also think, look at, look at your current boss. I mean, you might always the right way to leave a job, wrong way to leave a job, but you're mm -hmm. going to learn something no matter what from whoever you are under. And as you come out of school, this is what I'm seeing today with some candidates that come to me. They want to be overly confident because they want to, they've been told to present confidence. I want somebody who's teachable. I want somebody who doesn't know it all. I need them to know enough to ask the right questions. That's about it. I want to mold them. And so looking for event, for young people to look for mentors, I would say, start with your, your very first boss hmm. and view them as a mentor, even if they don't call themselves that. Learn everything you can from them. Ask them questions. 
appreciate the critique. And then if you're looking outside of that, look for someone where you go, that person really holds themselves to a high standard. I, I believe that's maybe two categories that I'd look for. That is such outstanding advice. I, as you were telling your story, I had a very similar mentor. So my first job was in broadcast television and my news director was also very harsh. Like he would call the second you got off the set. I mean, the, the show would be over and the phone would ring and you'd say, that's Lon. If you like Lon, I'm like, oh, he's got every little thing you did, but you, but you knew when you did do something well too, that that was earned. And so I think that that, yes. like you said, though, I remember um, hating it, it going through the process, but ha now I remember, but in now where I am at this stage of my career, I can look back and say, wow, almost everything that I've learned and built upon the foundations of that was learned in that very first position because he cared enough to teach us how to do things the right way. I work so. with a company right now that has a mantra internally that's striking me, which is that clear is kind. Yeah. And clear does not always mean nice. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between nice and kind. Yes. And, um, and when you're trying, I, I think I, I would probably be viewed by some current and former employees as challenging, demanding, you can label me how, you know, whatever, um, if they really knew it's because I care deeply about mm -hmm. what I do and I care about what we do for our clients and I do have high standards, doesn't mean I hate them for it. Just means right. I'm always going to challenge them to, to keep going beyond what they just did. And, and very much like Marie, again, I couldn't appreciate it till now. Mm -hmm. If you did put it in front of me 10 times, I could change it 10 times because there's right. always a way exactly. to make it better. Yes. Yeah. That's so just part of the process. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So it's, um, I think that it's an interesting place for younger graduates today mm -hmm. because there is this need to know things or assume they know things and to, and to, you know, convey confidence and to have all the right answers. And I'm, I'm looking for a teachable human who is logical and who can take critique. I mean, I always, my, one of my tricks is during the interview in the middle, I'm going to give it away here, but I will, I will redline their printed out resume, even if it's fine. I'll find some yeah, just to see how they respond. And middle of the interview, I just slide it across the desk and I watch uh -huh. them react. And some people get very defensive and some people, the, the ones that stand out to me are the ones that go, what, why'd you change that? Mm. I, you know, or ask the question or one person said, um, oh, this is great. My next interview is going to be much better because you... <gasps> you help make my yeah. resume better, you know? So I need to know that they're going to take critique. And especially in our world, yeah. we're in, we're in marketing. It's incredibly subjective. I mean, a lot of it's data yeah. driven today, right? But the, the creative part of it is very subjective mm -hmm. and a client could love what you produce one day and hate it the next. And you've got to have enough thick skin to take feedback without crumpling into a ball in the corner. I mean, you got to know that you've put out the best work. And if you did screw it up, you got to own it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm looking for. And I, I, I think it's harder to find today. I, I think in, in, I would say in everybody, not, but very much so in younger folks. And I'm, I'm seeking people that have thicker skin. Yeah. I think you've mentioned, you touched on something too, that's come up quite a bit in the podcast when we've talked to people who are professional storytellers, which I would consider you, Sue. I hope you consider yourself that because storyteller is such a broad term. But we, we're talking to people across professions. But one of the things that I'm sort of chewing on, because I've heard it a lot in this podcast, is curiosity and how to really create or embrace an attitude of curiosity, which is like what you're talking about, that openness, that reflectiveness, um, that engagement with people. And so I'm curious, at, you know, switching gears, but as a professional, you mentioned like, and this is true too, um, especially when you're working with brands and you work with, you know, all kinds of brands and companies and organizations. And sometimes they don't um, necessarily um, understand, right? Is that what you're saying? Like they're not happy with the work or it is subjective. Storytelling is subjective, especially when you're storytelling on behalf of an organization yes, or brand. That's what I'm getting at. Can you tell us how, like, what are your best tips for doing that type of storytelling? It's sort of being that, 
I would say you're almost like not you're not the middleman, but you're the story. Uh, what's the liaison? Yeah. <laughs> well, the we, we are. We're taking you know raw information and we're trying yeah. to make it appealing and connecting with an audience. So first tip is this: you got to know who your audience is. We have to Absolutely. start with the audience. And what do they care about? What do they listen to, read? What do they, what keeps them up at night? I hate that phrase. Everybody uses that phrase, but yeah. what bothers them? It, what annoys yeah. them? Um, because, you know, I, I heard this once um, and I, I cannot remember who told me this, but I've used it for literally decades. So I'm, I'll steal it as my own until I can tell you who that is. But people interpret data one way, intellectually. That's mm -hmm. numbers, statistics, figures, facts. People interpret stories three ways, intellectually, emotionally, and physically. That's why you go to the movies, your heart races, your palms get sweaty, your stomach turns, you know, it's, you physically react. Well, it's easier to remember a story because you got three ways that your body is ingesting that information. So whether I am promoting a new line of bearings to an industrial client, or I'm appealing to donors talking about the services at Akron Children's Hospital and they need to, you know, why they should give to that. I need to think about who I'm talking to and why they should care about what it is I have to say and what they're going to do with that information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the biggest tip is people go out with their own information thinking it matters because it matters to them doesn't care. I don't care if it matters to them. It only matters to the audience on the other end. So uh, audience analysis is, is critical to the success of storytelling. And then secondly, I would say it's, it's gotta be a mix of data and emotion. Mm -hmm. Even when you're talking about things that don't seem very emotional, like bearings, <laughs> but if a bearing goes down and a machine goes down, you're darn sure it's emotional. Mm -hmm. Because you're losing thousands of dollars, potentially a minute. You've got staff standing around. You're missing deadlines. Yeah, blood pressures go up. That's That creates an emotional reaction. So there always is a way to tell the story with those two things. But going out with one or the other, to me, it doesn't stick as a story. You're just sharing facts or you're just sharing a ball of emotion. Those two things that come together, I think, are the essence of a good story. I would agree. And we've heard, we've definitely heard those two things come back over and over again from our guests. Okay. We had to pause the podcast to let you in on this opportunity. If you're ready to elevate your brand storytelling, don't miss our training, Tell Better Stories, led by me, a seasoned television journalist and PR professor, and Kyle, an on-air meteorologist and video storytelling expert. This workshop unveils our secrets to craft compelling, personal-driven narratives that resonate with your audience. Learn our distinct approach that puts people first and brands second, leveraging six storytelling elements for maximum impact. Walk away with actionable strategies, tactics, and a clear process to replicate success in any organization. Check out the show notes to learn more about this offer or reach out to homeplacecreative at gmail.com. Do you have any, when you're talking about uh, analyzing an audience, there is, it seems to be like an overwhelm of information sometimes. Do you have any... Uh, tips or strategies for people to kind of avoid that overwhelm. But how, like, how do you, how do you hit the audience just right? Because like you said, that is, to me, that sort of involves a lot of things. It involves like timing. It involves knowledge. It involves, like you mentioned earlier, medium for your message. Right. So what do you take into consideration when you're working with clients to, to figure out where, where exactly to find, and then also um, deliver that message to the audience? We really try to take into consideration, there's, there's a lot more steps we take today than we ever used to, because the data available to you is wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it's funny, in, in my um, ad agency age ownership, there's a group of uh, like around my age or a little older, it's just like, you know, it's just not the same as oh, it yeah. was. Yeah. And uh, no, it's not, thank God, it's not, because... I have more data at my fingertips in seconds than I ever could before. So you've got great data that you can just go out and start, you know, plugging in what you do know about that audience. I still love though, um, market research that actually interviews people yeah, me too. because people use phrases and words 
that we wouldn't put into a, a statistical report or an, an analysis. We try to sound more academic when they might say, you know, something uh, very, you know, very frank and very conversational. So <clears throat> we had a client that that they thought that their value proposition was their product. Mm. Hands down, it's the quality of our product. That's it. That's what customers care about. So we convinced them to let us do some research and actually call some clients. I don't mean just a, you know, a radio button survey. This was call and talk to them and interview them and see where the, where the interview goes. Mm -hmm. And what we found out and they about fell out of their chair was when we asked them why they love this company, it's because somebody picks up the phone. Wow. And they were like, what? So we of course asked about the quality of their product and they, and most of the people said, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a given. That's a given. We know that the product's good, yeah. but they said their competitors, they get stuck into a large voice system and they can't mm -hmm. get a direct person. And they are confident that every time they call this company, they will pick up the, they will pick up the phone. Well, that changes the whole story. Sure. Does. The yeah. whole thing. Yeah. I mean, you could have product running all over behind you, but in the end, it's mm -hmm. about a human connection. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, as much, I mean, I, I, we researched, we do market, you know, market research. Um, we tried, we try to gather whatever surveys our clients have, if they're doing just quality assurance surveys or whatever, just to start to see some trends. We pull some demographics and psychographics, but I think the, the opinions that um, the people have that they're willing to share verbally can open the doors that you don't expect. Uh, from regular data that you might get in other places. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. Have you done any types of social listening? So like the social media listening, do you do any of that? How is that? I'm just curious about that. We had a, um, a guest on who was talking about data collection and, and figuring out more about your audience. And yeah, that seems to be a little, I don't know. I'm just curious. I think it's a little skewed. I mean, we definitely use it because there are people that will put their comments right in there and, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, or post things and you can start to see trends. I think they're great for trend management, seeing mm -hmm. negative, positive, neutral feedback. We like to socially listen and then categorize the feedback by, is that positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? Got but it. when you get into specific comments, um, the buffer that is this digital presence, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a natural buffer there right now of, I can say whatever I want mm -hmm. um, to incite people to do things like sure. my, like my comment, share my comment, um, rile groups up. I mean, mm -hmm. we just, I just um, saw a local scenario a few months ago where um, there was a restaurant where the owner did something I won't, I won't mention names. Oh, I think I know. I got like very, was it? Yeah, I know. I think I know what you're talking it about. Went it was bonkers. I mean, it shut yeah. them down, shut down yeah. their social, right? And which I'm not saying it didn't merit it from what I saw. It was like pretty egregious. Mm -hmm. That said, it's, you can't take, I think the social listening in, in a vacuum. Uh, I think you yeah. need to, I think it's great for trends. I think it can give you some uh, elements of, of education on what people Think about your brand or your product or a or a ideology, um, but you have to take it through the lens of people think they can say whatever they want, uh, and that doesn't mean that that single comment, which tends to get a lot of attention, mm -hmm. is actually the upheld view of the majority of your audience you're trying to reach. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. I think like as you were talking you know, like as you were speaking about that buffer between the screens, you know, we can type whatever we want. It seems like that's going to be naturally leading us for either, either something that's like really, really positive or really, really negative. So most people are probably going to fall in that in-between spot and that's who you're trying to reach. Then you might not, like you said, get an accurate view of what you're thinking versus the like, pick up the phone, have the focus group. You can get that one-on-one -on -one interaction to kind of dig a little deeper into what their needs and thoughts are. So, and you know, we as humans, we are incredibly negative beings. We will share <laughs> bad news. I think it's nine times. Yeah. We'll share a bad thing to nine people. We'll share a good thing to one. Yeah. So your yeah. the tendency on social, even though there are viral positive things that get shared, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
if you look at the things that get shared the most, it's generally negative feedback. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I guess to some extent you have to know that that is a true human trait and mm-hmm. remember that as you're building your story, people will, I mean, today, especially they will blow holes through your story quickly. And you could put out something great and be like, well, yeah, well I went there once and it was horrible. Yeah. And yeah. if that gets more traction than anything positive, you're, you're in a, in a really bad place. So it's, it's a very, uh, interesting world that we live in in the social space and how a few sentences can tell a story today you don't you don't have to work you don't have to work very hard to tell a story you can tell a story very quickly succinctly through one image a single image can launch a thousand you know bad responses Mm -hmm. um we we've helped our clients we do a lot of not a lot of but we do we do crisis communications for Mm -hmm. clients Mm -hmm. And most of them today are related to social and, yeah. uh, and that's why you need to have policies. That's why you need to not, no offense, trust your nephew who seems to be techie to run your social media. This is a message. This is, as, this is as much about your brand as your website or your logo or anything else. And to entrust those platforms to people who don't represent your brand don't know what to do when there's negative comments, don't have a plan in place for when things escalate, wow, you are putting yourself at risk as an organization. That's for-profit and nonprofit. Need to be aware that social media can kill you. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And I'm sure we can swap horror stories. (laughs) Um, Like, especially when, you know, social media was first coming out. Um, I have lots of friends in the business. But what would you say, kind of building off of that comment, Sue, what would you say to a company that comes to you or maybe like an entrepreneur or small business who is just entering into, they're like, listen, I want to build my brand. I want to build my brand with a good story. They have maybe solid purpose, vision, values. What advice do you have for them to start building that that brand, that, but that story, story around their brand, their brand storytelling? Their brand storytelling. Um there's a lot of ways I would go with it. I, I mean, we, we build off plan. We, you got to have a plan. You mm-hmm. can't assume mm-hmm. that the story is going to tell itself. Mm-hmm. You can't assume that it's just going to catch on. You know, it, this is not field of dreams. If you build it, they do not come. That's, that is not That it. might be that. I feel like I just found the line. For your <laughs> it's not. It's like, <laughs> well, I'm going to put my stuff out there and it's going to just magically Yes. grab hold. So you, yeah. you've got to have a methodical way. I, I think part of the hesitation with storytelling and a plan is for some reason, the plan feels rigid to me. And this is supposed mm. to be this mm-hmm. loose, like airy feeling, like it just kind of evolves into a story. No, you've got to have a plan of attack. I mean, at our firm, it's understand, understand where we want to go, what we want to do, who our audience is, all the understanding. Mm-hmm plan and then execute. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think that small businesses, and I can say this as my own, I am the shoemaker's Mm -hmm. children here. When you start a small entity, you usually are starting it based on your own set of skills. And it's a lovely way to build a business. You, you start doing what you know how to do. And then you start telling people about it and it, and then you start adding brand assets to it. You know, you get a website, Mm -hmm. You get some business cards, you start doing some social media, whatever. And then you have, you are only one person. So then you start adding people with you that, that do things that you don't do. And that's a, again, lovely way to grow a business until it's not, because if one of those people drop off, then you start taking over that stuff and things drop. And mm-hmm. are, when you're trying to do the work of the business and tell the story, it's often the thing that drops is telling of the story. Mm-hmm. Marketing always drops off when things go wrong. And it's just because you have to keep the lights on. And so mm-hmm. you're doing the things, if you're selling carpet, you don't have time to tell carpet stories. You have to buy, you know, get the carpet and get it installed and yeah. you know, keep customers yeah. happy. So you, you have to consider that as much of your business plan as you do making sure that you have the right, you know, uh, tax 
documents set up, making sure that you have um, the, the person answering the phone, marketing and storytelling, and that constant pushing of information out to your desired audience is as much of a priority as many of the other things. And for some reason, it gets deprioritized. Partly, I think, because of the advent of social media, I think people go, well, anybody can do that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, don't I need to, all the time. Yeah, I don't need to pay for it. I don't Mm-mm. need to invest in it. I don't really need a person. I've got a nephew who kind of plays in it. Yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. And they don't see it as a brand asset and they don't mm-hmm. see it as an important part of their entire business cycle end mm-hmm. to end. Mm-hmm. They see it as like this, this outside thing that I can take it or leave it. So I guess what I would encourage small businesses to do, there's two things I would say is one, build a plan for it and, and make it a priority. That's a great, yeah. Um, and, and number two is process, process, process. Um, be a process driven firm, even if you're small, because the only way that you're going to ever scale is by having process. And if you've got one person in your team who knows how to do your social media and nobody else knows, as soon as that person is gone or hit by the proverbial bus, you are starting from ground zero again. And so small business owners and I'm self-included, you go forward a little bit and then shoved back. It's like, you got to hook around, you know, one of those canes yeah. with the crook around your neck. Yeah. You're like, we're making, we're doing great. We're doing great. Something goes wrong back because yeah. you did not build processes that support your storytelling or your marketing. Mm-hmm. But, you, but you did for the actual skill that you're selling. Yeah. You know, you, you did, you know, you're delivering carpet, but that part of it, you didn't build processes for. And um, you know, manufacturing clients, uh, we have a lot of manufacturing clients we work with. They have amazing processes on their shop floors because if somebody doesn't follow process, not only are the products defective, but somebody could get hurt. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But go into some of the soft areas yep. of their company, like marketing sales is usually just, a it's just wide open territory. This salesperson sells this way. This salesperson oh, sales. sells this way. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about storytelling. This one tells that story. This mm-hmm. one tells that story. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the, all of the squishy functions mm-hmm. that they don't have processes. And it's the thing that becomes the Achilles heel every time. Because when that salesperson who does great work leaves and you have no process behind it, you start over. Oh, yeah. Oh, I am saying that because I've seen that so many times. I'm like, oh, the the way you said squishy. I love that term too. Because I would, you know, one of the things that I, because as you're talking, you know, yes, this matters for small businesses, but this also matters for like mid high level businesses as well. Like you said, your team could be totally I guess like off track when it comes to marketing and storytelling. Can you talk about the importance again across the board for organizations and businesses of cohesiveness when it comes <laughs> to your marketing and storytelling? It is uh it is the thing that stands out the most to me. We work with companies of all sizes from Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 to very small entities. And there is Well, first of all, marketing, which does most of the storytelling, Mm -hmm. is often not included at the table of some very important discussions. Hmm. So the lack of cohesion often happens because marketing's brought in at the tail end of, let's say, a new product development or a new, um, or just an emphasis, a campaign emphasis, something that they want to emphasize or or Mm -hmm. an objective for the year. And then it's like, here, here's this thing, marketing, you go run with it. And, and usually it's quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes the subject matter experts are unclear as far as who do I go to, to get the story. Mm -hmm. There isn't data on the audience. There isn't data on the audience. You're just supposed to go out and tell a story and then you get held accountable for the lack of results that come from that storytelling, even though if they would have been brought in six months sooner, marketing could have been do- doing some audience analysis, some, I mean, today in a world, it's wonderful in the digital world, we can do a lot of A-B testing 
mm -hmm. things to see what story pulls and what story mm -hmm. doesn't pull in paid advertising. And we could be doing all that. But what I see happen a lot um, in large and small companies is marketing's the last to know. And mm -hmm. then they're supposed to make a silks purse out of a sow's ear and they're supposed to have some brilliant story that then also generates leads, mm -hmm. generates traffic, generates leads. You know, they don't even set campaign objectives when they are setting, you know, the the objective of the sale, the sales objectives. Yeah. So, you're you're yeah. speaking my language. I'm like, oh yes, because I what I, I'm curious too, like the next my next line of questioning would be like, how important is it to set, I mean, for marketing, because I think that storytelling like you said it's kind of like soft squishy um but is obviously a very powerful communication tool when wielded or used correctly and thoughtfully and strategically how important and what advice would you give for people in marketing who that measurement piece right like how what are the best ways that you know to kind of quantify or qualify the results of um an effort a marketing effort you know cuz i i do think from what I've seen from students and clients, I run into some of those same issues uh, where, you know, you even ask the question like, hey, how are we going to quantify this? Or does this align with your marketing goals? And they don't necessarily even, they ne they don't even connect that. Like, for instance, like they're not connecting their social media to any type of quantifiable, measurable result. And then it comes back like, oh, I spent all this money in marketing didn't work. <laughs> That's I hear that so often. It's just like, we spent all this money and what a good, um, first of all, I, I will say that, um, in social media, um, we do a lot of social media advertising. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, there's, let me back up a little bit. So there's all different types of campaigns, sure. right? There are lead generation campaigns where, and there's lots of different uh, avenues you can take. Uh, it could be a, um, you know, you're doing an email campaign, a drip campaign, you're doing different, different types of platforms, different types of campaigns. Um, but for me, my opinion is it's very tough to get leads, mm -hmm. especially ones that sales or those in the C-suite think are qualified leads. Qualified leads do require a campaign where it's this, it's the big funnel. It's the marketing funnel, right? Where yep. you're sending a lot of things out and then you see who continues to engage, continues to engage, continues to engage until you've got them as a, you definitely know that they're a qualified lead, but there's an expectation that I'm getting leads up here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that you can't have a lead campaign, but you have to educate your internal, um, powers that be, that the lead thing, the leads don't occur up here. They don't occur at the top of the funnel. Mm. We are throwing a lot out there with the idea of defining and finding the audience that ultimately says, yes, I want an appointment. Yes, I want to buy, mm -hmm. click buy, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that wasn't the case, why would I have so many ads popping up in Facebook for golf clothes for me? Why? <laughs> yeah because yeah they they've I you mean know. obviously obviously they've heard me I play golf yeah um or and they've and they've tracked me I go to golf mm -hmm. courses right? mm -hmm. but I'm not clicking in all those ads mm -hmm. and so so I think that while people don't think that impressions count I believe they do because and and what they do they're a very important part of that first top level of the funnel because those stories that people engage with, like or share or interview, that moves them down more into this funnel. Uh, also, I mean, not so long ago, the best advice I could give to somebody locally was, "I'm gonna get you like ten billboards. All yeah. I've got is all I got is traffic counts, but at least I've got some impressions, right? Now yeah. I've got an actual, I've got data I can use on those right. impressions." I yeah. can say what works and what doesn't. This one yep. is, you know, this video is working stronger than this one. Changing the headline word, this one changed, you know, yeah. yielded this many results. So in terms of setting targets, um, there needs to be an educational component to your internal clients or to your, your superiors um, to say, this is a, a, a slow cooker, not a microwave thing. Mm -hmm. 
I love that analogy. It's yeah. it's going to it's going to take time. Mm-hmm. And I don't do social media ad campaigns for anything less than a year now. Period. Wow, a year. A year. I I really do. I think you're I think you're right on Sue. I mean, I've heard 90 days. I've heard but I think you're right. I think it's going to take a whole year. Yeah. And if they go, are you out of your mind? Then I'm like, I know there's other people that will do it for you shorter. But the problem is if you do it for 90 days and let's say you get a little uptick, you get some traffic over to your site or somebody clicks and buys your product. Right. And you go, this is cool, but I don't know if I want to fund it right now. So I'm going to put a break up, put the brakes on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You start back from zero. When you restart again, you mm-hmm. do not get the, you don't get the benefit of what you learn. So then for example, we have a client that like, uh, last year we did about 300,000 video views. Mm-hmm. This year we did 1.5 million. Wow. It's because you learn from the data and you find out what resonates with your audience. And, mm-hmm. and then I have to say on the, on the organic front, I mean, I guess we have to kind of contrast this. There's storytelling yeah. going on everywhere. Right. But yeah. But paid, um, paid gets you in front of people. Organic. You're looking at now they're saying, latest stats I've seen are about one and a half to 2% of your followers will see the content you post on organic. Wow. So it's not like it's not important. You need Mm -hmm. to make sure that you have some vibrancy on your pages. But if Mm -hmm. you think that organic social is going to get you somewhere, it's not. Mm -hmm. However, the stories that you tell on organic is great fodder for ads. And I don't just mean like boosted posts. I mean, I mean, yeah. if you get if you put an organic post out and you do get some traction or some great comments, let's steal that and tell mm-hmm. that story in a paid format, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it, I think that um, back to your setting of, of objectives, I think you do need to set objectives. If you've got 300 likes on your, on your um, LinkedIn page and you want to move that to 500, you need to work with strategists who can say, Yes, we can get you to 500 likes and we're going to do a campaign to drive people over to like your page, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's going to take this long and this much budget. Yeah. So it's, yes, set that, but I really hesitate to tell people that they're going to get leads because they will, but it's going to come in six months Mm -hmm. or nine months after we know what your audience is doing with your stuff and most business owners, particularly small ones do not want to wait around that long. No, no. Love what you're hearing on this podcast. Consider booking me to speak at your next event. Dive further into the transformative power of storytelling with my keynote, tell better stories, speak up, stand out and build community in a world that often amplifies our differences. My talk invites you to embrace genuine connections, break free from the echo chambers and discover the art of storytelling. Learn how to share your own narrative, listen actively, and foster communities that flourish on shared experiences. Check out the show notes to learn more about how to book a talk for your next event. Switching gears a little bit, Sue, I know that you mentioned that most of the business for your firm, if not all of it, comes from referrals. Yeah. So, I mean, I I love that idea, too, of that being a story that I think when I talk to clients, you know, that's always the first... Those are the first people that I want to talk to. Who are your happy clients? Tell me about them. Tell me about the times where you just felt like you were fulfilling your purpose in life and you were, you know, so how, what advice can you give kind of breaking away from the social media world, which I know is important, but I don't think enough, enough attention gets paid to that face to face, especially if you're a local based business. Um, or organization. Um, but even now, like having the conversation that we're having over Zoom is is the next best it's the next best thing, Sue. So, but do you have any advice for people about, you know, how to build their referral networking through storytelling? Um, it really comes down to relationships. It really mm-hmm. comes down to giving a rip about people. Yeah. That's it. It comes down to I, people refer to us. I mean, I hope that they refer to us because we do good work. You know, that, that, that would be lovely, but I think they refer to us because they trust us. I think they refer to us because when we've screwed things up and we have, we've owned it. I think that they refer to us because we read in in a meeting that they've got a troubled look on their face and we stop before we get into work and say, you all right? 
uh, I think that is a lost art. That's what's missing is trying to teach particularly younger grads, right? That when you demonstrate care to people, that goes along, that becomes the story that they tell about you. Hmm. Um, I get a lot of, here, here's a weird one. If somebody sends me a referral, even if the referral doesn't work out, like we're not a right fit or they're not a right fit for us. I still handwrite every time a thank you note to the person who referred me. That person put their neck on the line for me. Yeah. But anytime anyone sends you work, I mean, nobody has to do that anyway. Nobody has to do anything nice for you anyway. But if somebody actually stuck their own reputation on the line for me, that's gigantic. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's it's the balance of doing good work, but also how you feel when you're with those people. Um, so uh, we just we just got a client uh, in December from a woman that I worked with 15 years ago at another mm -hmm. another firm. Mm -hmm. And she thought of us and she said, I called you because I knew you would be, this is what she said. Cause again, I'm listening to why did you call me? Why did you call me? I said, you know, she said, I knew that you would be responsive. I knew you would tell me if this wasn't going to work. Uh, and I knew that I could hand things over to you and I wouldn't have to tend them. I wouldn't have to, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, keep tending them. So that told me some things that she valued. And then that becomes my story to other people is clients call me because mm -hmm. they don't have to micromanage me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to shoot straight. And, um, and they, she knows that she can entrust us with, if we say yes, she can entrust us with it. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes down to listening. And I think uh, another way to, to also build the referral network is to get involved in the community. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say how much and then how important it is to be on a board hmm. for a number of reasons, um, especially young professionals. Get on, volunteer at a nonprofit. Even if you're not on the board itself, get on a committee because you meet a lot of people from a variety of backgrounds. You are all focused on the, the good of something. So you've all got a, a combined you know, a, a group effort on something, doing something good. Mm -hmm. So that's always a great place to start. But conversations will just come up naturally. You start to learn, oh, you're in accounting. How long you've been doing accounting? Where do you work? You just chit chat mm -hmm. and you get to learn about people. And that those kind of referrals then come naturally. And again, it's based out of trust and knowledge of a person. Mm -hmm. They have confidence in you before they've even seen your work. Uh, and I don't think young people are, uh, I keep saying young people, but I wasn't encouraged that either. I don't, I think I was in my thirties before I joined my first board. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have joined a little sooner. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was going to be such an important part of my career trajectory, but a lot of people that I've met and a lot of work I've gotten has been from community involvement. That's, and I love, I love that approach because it's sort of, it feels like a much more organic way to network because and you know, you're doing something good for the community, hopefully something you're interested or that you care about. I mean, that would be the goal and you're fine. You're probably just going to, as you, you know, you're going to naturally attract like-minded people, you know, who you want to work with. And that's just, like you said, it's a very beautiful process to be a part of. And it doesn't feel like, because sometimes when I, I, at least for me, Sue, when I was younger, when I heard the term networking, I would just get like this, like, the young kids call it like all the, the students that I'm around, they say like, oh, I just get the ick. Like it makes me feel icky. And I'm like, yeah, because you're like, I do this and I do that versus like volunteering with somebody. Yeah. Right. It's a natural or joining, you know, like you said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge thing. You know, I've heard people give the advice like you like running, go join a running club, like get out, get meet people, um, get more involved. So I love that as an approach to referral networking. And I um. Yeah, I told ahead. them, I tell uh, students when I go speak in classes that if they want to make their resume stand out, so marketing students in particular, um, go volunteer at a nonprofit with a something that you care about. If you care about yeah. animals, go work yep. at the, but, but tell them you'll do a marketing campaign for them for free. 
Ah, that's beautiful. So tell this, you go tell their story. You go down there, film it on your phone. It doesn't have to be fancy. They don't have anything anyway. Right. Um, They're just going to love it. Just, just uh, record what you see, go down, you know, put, uh, take, um, take video, write a bunch of social media posts, hand it to them and say, here is a bunch of stuff that you can use for free. You get to add it to your portfolio. They then fall in love with you and you might get introduced there. It might even open a door for you job wise, but you've, you've got to take the steps to, um, to volunteer and do things and put yourself out there, but why not benefit you too? you know, build content that you would be proud to show in a portfolio. And at the same time, you help that nonprofit. Yeah, that's beautiful. Right. And then you just, like you said, you continue to build that relationship and trust with everybody around you, who I'm sure is, you know, at this point in your career that you never know. I mean, as the years go on, who's going to be where and what they're going to do. And and they'll remember, like you said, 15 years later, somebody remembered you to refer you based on, you know, trust, like you said, friendship interaction. So yeah, I just love that. Is I just think it's a much, it to me, it feels like a much on, more honest way to network, a much more natural way to do it. So that's great advice. Thank you so much don't, for sharing. Don't burn that. bridges. That's the other thing. Don't yeah. burn bridges. Yeah. I mean, I don't care if you hate your job, right way to leave a job, wrong way to leave a job. You yeah. never know where people are going to end up in the future and, you know, just leave with respect. If you need to leave, thank them for, again, the lessons mm-hmm. that you learned, yeah. even, even bad bosses, even mm-hmm. bad situations, you learn something that's right. And you should be thankful for that. So, mm-hmm. um, that's, that's the other key to networking is just don't burn bridges and keep those doors open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's all great advice too. And I feel like I could I could talk to you all day. But as we uh as we wrap up on our storytelling conversation today, we have three rapid fire questions. We always ask everybody at the end of the interview. So okay. um, hopefully they're not too tough. But uh the first one is what is your favorite story? So any form like book, movie, song, poem. Oh my gosh. That's a hard one. Uh <laughs> it, <laughs> or, or series. <laughs> My favorite story, uh, oh my goodness. Um, mm, 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 that's a quick one. Uh, even current one. So not to okay. make it like the whole. So yeah. I'll say one of my favorite series that I never expected to get sucked into. And I totally did was Game of Thrones. Really? And <laughs> I, I loved it. I hate swords. I'm bad on gore. I mean, it's really not my genre at all. <laughs> and I found that I could not stop watching this crazy series. Yeah. And I think it's because, you know, you were just, you were sucked into the families of, of, you know, the, the families of the, of these folks. I'm not a big series watcher. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a very much a law and order person because okay. it's, it's a single episode and there's a, there's a problem, you know, there's a climax, <laughs> somebody's either guilty or not guilty. And you're it's very methodical. <laughs> yes. I, um, I like, I like short things like that. Um, I mean, I love, I love Bible stories I and mean, I do, I think mm-hmm. they're fascinating and the detail is pretty amazing. But if I were to talk about, um, a, a series of stories that sucked me in, it would be Game of Thrones for sure. That's, you're, that's awesome. I love that. How about um, the best storytelling advice you've heard that you just need to share or and or the worst advice you ever heard that you need to warn us all about? Um, okay, so the I attended uh, the Global Speakers Academy uh, for the Entrepreneurs Organization, its mm-hmm. inaugural class uh, three years ago. And the uh, storytelling coach, his name is Pat Quinn. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he has coached Tony Robbins. He's coached a ton of people. And then there were three other coaches there. It was just amazing week of intensive Mm -hmm. training. But one thing that I loved about his, and storytelling often happens in presentations, right? Mm -hmm. And the best advice, because somebody said, well, how do you make good transitions? Oh, that is, that's a tough. And I'm like, yes, how do you do that? Right. (laughs) And he said, I look at the audience and say, that's all I have to say about that. And I said, it's really that simple? No way. Like, 
Yeah, you keep I've been this. overcomplicating it this long. <laughs> and I have started to do that. Uh-huh. I have started to do oh, that. Wow. And I have found people actually really vibe with it because huh. they know it gives them a break in the action. If you were if you were reading it in a book, right? Mm-hmm. You come to a chapter ending. Yeah. There, sometimes chapters end completely abruptly. You they don't start into another sentence in the next chapter. You could be a whole new scene. But when we're publicly speaking or telling a story, it's like we think we have to have some kind of connecting point. What if you don't? What if you just give the audience a break and say, we're done with that? So I think that was one of the best pieces of advice. And I've I've used it. I like that. I like giving audience it just explicitly saying, hey, here's a break. You know, it's sort of what you're doing, right? Well, that's all I have to say. Okay, let the click, 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 click. Okay, on to the next thing, right? I do. That's a really, I, I never thought of that. Too, can I give an alternative? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can pick which one you want to put in this. Um, a great piece of advice that I learned at the Global Speakers Academy um, as part of the Entrepreneurs Organization Global Training was that when you want to draw somebody into a conclusion to a story, mm-hmm. um, there are three things that you can put before them. One is to have them picture something that happens next week that's a change that they'd want to make or a very slight change that they'd want to make or a a slight adjustment. And it'd be like something I can see next week. And another one is one that you can put out far in advance. Picture yourself a year from now in that, you know, um, that favorite outfit you know, mm-hmm. if you're talking about weight loss or something like that, in yeah. that favorite outfit that you always wanted to wear, you'll you'll see that out there a lot. But this one, I did not know. And I think it's the most powerful. And again, I've used it and it works. Um, you want them to, you want the audience to picture themselves hearing something from someone they care about. Mm. So in the weight loss example, instead of just that outfit, Picture a day when your husband goes, oh, girl, you looking hot. Yeah, you experience, you put them there. You put them there. Yeah. Or, and so I, I went through this training. I was like, this is brilliant. And I really never thought about it. And I had a mm-hmm. meeting soon after that training. And I had, I mean, it was a brand new client call. And I said to the client, this is the first meeting. And at the end of me, I said, picture a day when, your boss says oh, to you, I am so pleased that marketing and sales are finally talking to each other. And I watched this man sit back in his chair and he said, let's schedule the next meeting right now. Oh, like, so it's, it's yeah. not. And I, and remember like storytelling is not manipulation. I no, don't want it to right. be changed for that, but but a good storyteller does draw you in and put, mm-hmm. puts the reader, puts the listener in the center of the story. And sometimes when you're telling your own story, you forget that there is a listener, number one. And two, that, that if you've lost them, you can, you can bring them back into the story. So that visceral, who would, who would that audience want to hear from? And what would they want to hear them say? That's been a good filter for me at the end of conversations. And I've used it a lot and love it. I love that as well, because it brings up something else that I feel like has, you have brought up several times in this interview, and it's that idea of listening. Like a good storyteller is a great listener, right? Because you, to know where to place the audience from the start of a conversation, like you said, with that client to the end, you had to really be able to listen to them to figure out what their pain point was. And then exactly. that's just another way of saying it back to them that shows that you really were listening and that you truly do understand their need which involves that care and, and everything we've been talking about. So what I love, yeah. but I love, I've never heard of that, but I'm going to start using it too, Sue. I love that advice. Thank you. Yeah. What a gem. Uh, and then the last question is, how do you define storytelling in your own words? In my own words, storytelling is uh, sharing experiences that elicit a response. I'll leave that vague from another party. Uh, It's actually a storytelling is actually a two way thing. It's not storytelling if there isn't a response. 
Uh, otherwise, it's just uh, uh, an information dump. I love that. Thank you. What a lovely note to end on. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Sue. So much knowledge in this episode for, for all kinds of business owners and organizations in terms of marketing and messaging and storytelling. So I'm just so grateful for your time today. Thanks so much, Meg, for your time and uh, happy to do this. Many blessings. We're so glad you've listened to this podcast episode. If you liked it, would you mind doing us a favor? Share this episode with someone who would be interested in the topic too. We're on a mission to help everyone become a better storyteller. And don't forget to subscribe to the show to get updated every time we release a new episode. Each and every episode is produced, hosted, and edited by us, Megan Kyle Adams at Home Place Creative. Happy storytelling.